Okay, we have one more theorem. And I don't think we're going to be able to finish it in this session. I hope we can, but I would rather not rush it. So maybe we'll get halfway through it and try to end it at a logical point that we can come back to on Thursday. Because I think this is a good proof to understand. Let X be a Banach space such that every bounded subset of X is dentable. Then X has the right on nicotine property. This will complete our circle of implications. And all of these properties we've discussed so far turn out to be equivalent. So let's get into the proof and please do butt in if I'm going too fast and tell me to slow down because yeah, I should slow down in this proof. So the first thing we're going to do is to consider the measure space and let's only consider a finite measure space. And we'll also consider a vector measure, new x value vector measure. Such that the norm of new of a in x is less than or equal to mu of a for all a in the sigma algebra. This is a condition that's stronger than absolute continuity formally, but it will suffice to work with these. So we'll show that there exists F L1 with respect to mu, such that the vector measure nu is given by integration against the vector valued function F. So not F D mu, let's just say F mu. And this is a, this looks like it's not enough to prove the right on nicotine property because we need to prove it for all vector measures that are absolutely continuous with respect to any measure mu, not just finite ones. But there is a proposition in the notes that says that this suffices to prove the right on nicotine property. Now, I remember saying in the lecture that it suffices to check it for finite measures. This is somewhat stronger. It suffices to check it for finite measures and assuming you have this property rather than just absolute continuity. This clearly implies absolute continuity because if mu of a is zero, then the norm of mu of a is zero, which says that mu of a has to be zero, right? But you've also got a bit finer control here. You've got like a constant one here. You could up, generally you could have a constant C there. We're gonna take that to be one, you know? This is enough. You should check the notes. Right, okay. So how do we go about constructing this F? This is a bit of a long-winded process and we're gonna gradually get through it. First, we have to define some sets. So for all sets in the Sigma algebra A, we're gonna define some collections of sets. So A plus of A I have too many A's in this proof. So a, sig, curly A plus of A is the set of all sets in the sigma algebra that are contained in A and that have positive measure. That's what the plus is for, plus for positive. And we'll simply let A plus be A plus of S. So this is just the set of sets in A of positive measure. They're contained in S, S is the full space. And for all A of positive measure, for all A and A plus, we're gonna define some vectors, X sub A. The vector X sub A is 
our normalized version of the, me the new measure of A. And we let C sub A be the set of all the vectors X sub B for B contained in A of positive measure. So this is given a, a set, we will get a set of vectors associated with that set. So they're all, in a sense, all of the vectors corresponding to sets contained in that set. But we're using this interplay between sets and vectors here. Now by the assumption on the, the vector measure nu, the norm of the vector xa, this is mu of a to the minus one times the norm of nu of a. And the assumption was that the norm of nu of a is less than nu of a or equal to. So the norm of this vector is less than or equal to one. So all of these vectors are normalized. Well, maybe not normalized. They have norm less than or equal to one. They can have norm smaller than one. So what does this tell you? So the sets CA are all bounded. And therefore they are all dentable by assumption. We assuming every bounded subset is dentable. So these sets here are all dentable. They've all got some curvature or some corners or something somewhere. And we have to exploit that to construct the radon Nicodem derivative f. Now the first real step of the proof, because this is all just set up so far, this is just definitions. The first real step is to prove the following claim. And this might take us the rest of the hour proving this claim. The claim is that for all epsilon and for all A of positive measure, there exists a subset A prime. So it's a subset of A and it has positive measure. Such that the diameter of the set C sub A prime, I'll type it in my notes, is less than or equal to two epsilon. This is our claim. What does this mean for every set and given a, a scale epsilon? We can find a subset such that all of the associated vectors are close to each other. The diameter of this set of vectors is less than two epsilon. Let's prove the claim gradually. We prove this by contradiction. We assume that there exists an epsilon greater than zero and an A and A plus, such that the diameter of C A prime is greater than two epsilon for all A prime contained in A. So all A prime in A plus A, like that. Everybody agrees that this is what we need to prove if we want to, well, this is what we need to assume if we want to prove this by contradiction. There exists a scale, there exists a set, and there exists some subset of that. Uh, no, then such for all subsets of that, these sets C, A have to be somewhat separated. They can't just be arbitrarily close together. So this assumption implies that for all X, this won't make sense immediately, but I will explain it. For all X in the space, for all A prime contained in A, there exists a set B contained in A prime, such that X minus the vector XB in norm has to be greater than epsilon. If you're really good at math, and I'm not, you'll see that immediately. 
And if you're like a normal person and you don't immediately see why that is, here's the proof. If this were not true, there would exist an X tilde in X such that X tilde minus XB in norm is less than or equal to epsilon for all B contained in A prime. Yeah. When negating there exists B such that this is true. Uh, well now we're in getting this whole thing here. There should exist a bad X like this. X has to be close to XB for all of the Bs contained. Hang on, did I forget a, a quantifier here? For all X, for all X, I should also say there exists an A prime. Such as for all B contained in A prime, X is close to all of these vectors. And that would imply that if I took XB prime and XB for all B and B prime contained in A prime. Then by the triangle inequality, this is less than XB prime minus X tilde plus X tilde minus XB. And by our assumption on this X tilde that we've constructed, this would have to be less than two epsilon. And that implies that the diameter of the set where I took the vectors from, the diameter of C A prime has to be less than or equal to two epsilon. And that is what we're assuming is not true. Um, have I made any mistakes here? There are a lot of quantifiers and a lot of negations. And I always worry a bit when I see such a thing. This is the key thing that we, we have to work with. We're doing a proof by contradiction and we have this property to work with and we have to derive our contradiction from that. Feel free to ignore the, the derivation of that. Just remember that we have this property here. We're gonna come back to it. We're gonna use that to get our contradiction. Okay, so what do we have now? We wanna get a contradiction from that. We're assuming dentability still. And let's fix A prime contained in A. Uh, what do we have? Yeah, we have epsilon is given, A is given, and now we're gonna take an arbitrary A prime in A. It's very easy to get confused about what you're given, what we have here already fixed. So we fix A prime. What do we do now? We let B lambda over some indexing set lambda be a maximal collection of disjoint elements of A plus of A prime such that the distance between, what do you want the distance between A prime, X A prime and X B lambda is less than epsilon. How do we know that such a thing exists? Greater than. Greater than epsilon, you mean. You wrote greater than and you said less than. I meant greater than. I was reading right to left somehow. Yeah, how do we know that such a thing exists? We have this property that we're working with here. You can find a set, so given A prime, we can find a set B such that these vectors X minus XB take X to be X A prime, uh, far apart. So we know that one of these vectors exists. So then we look at all of the sets that are disjoint to that B and we take another one. And we implicitly use Zorn's lemma to say that a maximal collection exists, right? But first you do need that one of these vectors exists before you can invoke that. 
by our assumption that at least one vector exists. So there is a maximal collection. And yeah, so lambda here is just an indexing set. We don't know anything about how big lambda is. Lambda could be massive. It could be massively uncountable, except it's not. <laughs> we have to prove that though. So since the sets B lambda are disjoint and have positive measure, because they're in A plus, so they all have positive measure. We know that the sum, the possibly uncountable sum of their measures is less than or equal to the measure of A prime because they're all disjoint and they're all contained in A prime. And this set's got finite measure because we're working on a finite measure space from the beginning. So when you have a possibly uncountable sum of positive things and that sum is finite, you have to have only had countably many things. I think I've used that result before in this course. I really like this result. So lambda is at most countable. Could be finite for all we know, but at worst it's countable. And we do need that. So by construction, we have that the measure of A prime minus all of these sets B lambda has to be zero. Haven't proven it yet. I will prove it. We'll call it exclamation mark. If this were false, we could find a set which we'll call B sub exclamation mark, just to be confusing with our notation, B sub exclamation mark contained in A plus of A prime minus this union which is contained in A plus of A prime. It's important that we're assuming that this measure is not zero here. If this measure were not zero, then there'd be some sets in, in A plus of this set. You can actually have some positive measure subsets of this. We can find a B exclamation mark. Oops. Such that the vector X A prime minus the vector X B exclamation mark is greater than epsilon. Why can we find such a vector? We can find such a vector because of this property up here. Except we take our set A prime, instead of A prime, we take it to be A prime minus this union of sets. So we find a B that's contained in that, it's got positive measure and the vector is far apart from a given vector X. And we tell our given vector to be X A prime. So yeah, if this measure up here were positive, then we could find another vector, X B exclamation mark. And then we could, we could add this vector to our collection. Well, not the vector, but the set. We could add the set B exclamation mark to the set B lambda and get a larger set or a larger collection satisfying the assumptions. The assumptions that we had on this collection when we constructed it. But this collection is maximal. So we definitely can't add another element to it. It's maximal, right? So it follows that this statement exclamation mark, this measure is equal to zero. This has to be true. Nice roundabout way of proving that. So what do we get now? So the assumption on the vector measure nu, the fact that it's controlled by mu implies that nu of this set 
is also zero. It's a zero vector. Okay. And now this union here is countable because we proved before that the indexing set lambda was at most countable. I should say at most countable union. So by countable additivity, which we assumed as part of the definition of a vector measure, we have that nu of a prime is equal to the sum over lambda of nu of b lambda. That's where all of that got us. Is anybody too confused at this point? Do I need to clarify anything? So you literally just proved that it was a vector measure. That's all we were doing just then. Oh, right? I haven't proven it's a vector. I'm using that it's a vector measure. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. okay. I thought that what was I want is what I'm really showing here. Well, this is really the goal. What I want to show is that if you take the union of these sets B lambda, you're getting a prime up to a new null set. It could be that the union of these B lambdas doesn't actually give you all of A prime, but what's left over has measure zero. So then I can invoke the countable additivity. As to why I would do that, that's not clear yet, right? It's a complicated proof. We got to set up quite a bit and then it's one of those proofs where you have to go through the whole proof and then look at it again. <laughs> then everything makes a bit more sense. But it's a bit hard to do that in the context of a lecture. I have to go through it once and then move on. So let's go through it. So we got this from countable additivity. And this lets us write, so we can We can write x a prime in a nice way. Before, before I write that, I'm just going to look back at what we're trying to prove because it's very easy to lose track of what we're proving. We have this property and what do we want? We want to derive a contradiction. Okay, that's all we're doing. We're trying to find a contradiction somewhere. We're going to contradict the dentability that we assumed. So we have to write our vectors somehow as elements of convex holes of dented sets, closed convex holes and that's going to violate dentability, right? Okay, so x a prime, by definition, it's this normalized measure. And we can now write the measure of a prime as a sum of these measures. So we have mu a prime, mu of b lambda. And then writing that in terms of the vectors x of b lambda, this is the sum over lambda, the measure of b lambda, the mu measure, mu b lambda, divided by mu of a prime of the vector x of b lambda. So what have we done here? We've written x of a lambda as an infinite convex combination of the vectors x b lambda, possibly infinite. If this sum were finite, this would be a convex combination, but it's infinite. So we're actually looking at a limit of convex combinations. So we're getting something in a closed convex hole. So by, okay, by the exclamation mark up here, what was that? Yeah. What this tells us is that the sum over lambda of mu b lambda on mu a prime this is equal to one. Sorry, I was saying before that this is a convex combination, but I hadn't proved that the coefficient sum to one. We need that for it to be a convex combination. The coefficients do sum to one because the sum of the measure of mu of b lambda is equal to mu of a by exclamation mark. So we divide by mu of a prime, you get one. All right. And on top of that, we know that x of b lambda this is in the set C of A prime because B lambda is contained in A prime. And it is not in the ball of radius epsilon around X A prime. Why do we have that? We have it by construction somewhere. Yes. 
The B lambdas are disjoint elements of A plus of A prime. So they're contained in A prime. And we have this separation of vectors here. So X of B lambda is far away from X of A prime. So putting all that together, we have this. And that tells us that X of A prime is in the closed convex hull of C A prime, take the ball of radius epsilon around X A prime. And we did this for all A prime contained in A because we just picked an A prime. I think that's what I did. Yeah. A prime was arbitrary. What does this tell us? This tells us that C of A prime, which is the set of all X A prime. Uh, hang on, C A, A prime in A. The set C sub A is not dentable. Uh, not dentable at scale epsilon, but epsilon was arbitrary if I remember correctly. Did we fix epsilon? Actually, this is enough. It's not dentable at scale epsilon there. We've, we were given an epsilon as part of this contradiction condition. We didn't know, we can't do this for all epsilon, but we have an epsilon. But the set's not dentable at scale epsilon, therefore it's not dentable. Because being dentable means you're dentable at all scales. Being not dentable means it fails to be dentable at some scale. So we have some epsilon for which we can't, for which we have the non-dentability. And that's enough to prove that the set's not dentable. Here's our contradiction. And what does that give us? That gives us the, the claim. What was our claim? I'm gonna copy and paste it because I don't wanna write it out a second time. Copy. and paste. So we've proven the claim, which for some reason has not been put in red. That's what we've proven. Questions? It's a straightforward enough proof to follow, but to, to really grasp is a different question. We're not done though. That was just the proof of the plane. We still want to construct this right on Nicodemus derivative F of the measure nu with respect to nu. And we haven't started that yet. Now, can I do the rest in the time we have? It's possible. Let's see how we go. So now let's fix epsilon greater than zero. We're going to use the claim. By the claim, there exists a maximal, we're doing a similar argument to before, a maximal disjoint collection uh, what am I calling it? A lambda. This lambda is now a different indexing set potentially. We've erased the lambda from before. We find a maximal disjoint collection A sub lambda of sets in A plus such that the diameter of C A lambda, whoop, not A prime, A lambda is less than or equal to two epsilon. So as before, the claim tells us that one exists. And then we can start to use Zorn again and say, okay, if one exists, there's a maximal collection. Of course, there's some Zorn details that aren't being checked here. You need to check that if you take like a collection, you can, you need to show that chains have limits, right? You need to show that you can just take unions of disjoint sets and you'll get a, it'll all work out. So there exists one with that property. So I can say there exists a maximal disjoint collection with that property. 
then lambda is at most countable by the same argument as before. Take the sum of the measures, show that it's finite. They're all, they're all positive, so you know it's a countable set. And you also have that mu of the full space S take away the union of the A lambda is zero. Um, and again, it's pretty much the same argument as before. If it weren't true, then you could use the claim to pick out another set that has the same property and add it to the supposedly maximal collection, violating maximality. And I won't give the details of that. So now what we can do is we can construct a function g sub epsilon, which is the sum over lambda. So it's a good thing this is countable times the characteristic function of a lambda tensor with the vector x a lambda. This is going to be an approximation of our rattle Nicodem derivative f. It's going to be epsilon close to it. Uh, this function is integrable because it's bounded and because the measure is finite. It's bounded because all of these x's are normalized. They've all got norm less than or equal to one. So the function is bounded and the underlying measure is finite. So it's integrable. And what we'll show is that if you take the vector measure nu that we're working with and you look at its distance to this vector measure, mu times the function g sub epsilon, you look at that in variation, this is going to be less than or equal to two times the measure of the space times epsilon, Whoop. which says that g sub epsilon is pretty close to being a rattle Nicodem derivative of nu. And epsilon is arbitrary. Of course, g sub epsilon depends on epsilon. That's not a problem. This will hold once we show it for all positive epsilon, which tells us that nu is in the closure in variation norm of the set G mu for G in L1 which is in the space of measures valued in X. Now, this set is closed. And that's an exercise in the notes. And it's not hard to show. So new is in the closure of this closed set. So new is in that set. So this will tell us that new is actually G mu for some G in L1. Well, I've been calling this rattle Nicodem derivative F. So I should say that mu is F, mu is F mu for some F, but this is the same thing. And this will tell us that X has the rattle Nicodem property. I have one thing left to show, which is this. Once we've shown that the proof's complete. And I've got two and a half minutes. I think I can do that in two and a half minutes. If you'll allow me to go possibly five minutes over time, we can finish the proof. And I think at this point, we're, we're just too far and we have to finish the proof. Deal with it. So let's prove this. This is called double exclamation mark. So let's prove it. First, let's consider a set A of positive measure. And let's look at nu of a minus g of epsilon mu of a. Let's look at this measure. We look at, we take the sum over all lambda. We say this is nu of a intersect a lambda by the disjointness and the fact that these measures sum to the measure of a by something we proved up there, this one here. Uh, minus the integral over a intersect a lambda of g epsilon d mu. Just using the definitions and the fact that these, this collection a lambda is maximal. So the measures add up properly. And we simplify that a bit. We know what g epsilon is 
on a lambda. Actually, it's constant on each of these a lambdas. So what we get here is mu of a intersect a lambda times the value on that set, which is just the vector x a lambda. Yep. And we collect our terms. We write that as the measure of mu measure, mu of a intersect a lambda times the vector x a intersect a lambda minus x a lambda using the definitions of these vectors. What this tells us is that mu of a minus g epsilon mu of a in x, its norm is less than or equal to the sum over lambda of mu of a intersect a lambda times the norm of this difference just by the triangle inequality. And we know that both of these vectors are in C of A because A intersect A lambda is contained in A and A lambda is contained in A. So this is less than or equal to the diameter of C A, which is less than or equal to two epsilon by our planar. That is the form the claim took, wasn't it? Dx is a prime, ah, diameter of C a prime is less than two epsilon, but these are both in a prime, <laughs> not in a. Is that what we did? Where were our a lambdas? Ah, no, it was here. <laughs> yeah. A lambda is constructed such that the diameter of C a lambda is less than two epsilon. And both of these vectors are in that set. This one trivially, this one because a intersect a lambda is contained in a lambda. Okay, so this gives us less than or equal to two epsilon times the sum of these measures, but these are disjoint, they're all contained in a, so you get mu a. And we're almost done. Now we just take the supremum over all partitions of S. And it tells you that nu minus G epsilon mu, I don't need the brackets, in variation is less than or equal to two epsilon times mu of S. And that's our proof. All right. It's the end of the lecture. I will just quickly state the theorem in the quickest way as possible. What have we proven? Right on Nicodem property implies one Martingale convergence property, which implies infinity Martingale convergence property, which implies no bounded separated trees, which implies that every bounded subset is dentable, which implies the rudder nicotine property. Finally, and it only took us five weeks. <laughs> Good, that was the goal. And we now know that all of these properties are equivalent in particular, whoops, I want to undo that. Where's my undo button? It's gone. Okay, in particular, the one Martingale convergence property is equivalent to the infinity Martingale convergence property. So all of the Martingale convergence properties are equivalent for every P, which is nice to know. If you have convergence for one P, you've got it for all P. That's equivalent to the rudder nicotine property, which is a nice natural measure theoretic property. That's equivalent to every bounded subset of the space being dentable, which is purely geometric. It doesn't use anything outside the Barnack space, which is nice. And that also says that there are no bounded separated trees in your space. So if you like to think of trees in the Barnack space, this also tells you something there. And as it says in the notes, there are tens of equivalent characterizations of the rudder nicotine property. I think there are like 30 that are in this book, maybe slightly less. And yeah, it's an important property. And now you know a few characterizations of it. And this concludes the lecture and also concludes the section on the rudder nicotine property. Okay, any questions? I got a quick one. So yep. just with that proof that you gave us, uh, is, is that sort of like the generalization for normal radon, like the scale, scalar value radon Nicodim theorem? Like, so if we were to 
like you sort of take the ideas from that proof and then you express it in the right like Banach language. Honestly, I don't know the proof of the scalar right on Nicodemus theorem. I only know this proof. I know <laughs> comes in like at some point. So, so, but you know, that's a lot of proof. Yeah, maybe you do something like that, that you just, at some point you can just use compactness of the unit ball or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, because sure. you've got that. If you're in a finite dimensional space, you've got compactness and you don't have to worry about all these dentability things because compactness is probably going to do the job for you. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So this is, this yeah. is probably more difficult. To, yeah. well, or you can do the proof that I didn't do that goes directly from infinity MCP to Radon Nicodem property. You can reduce it down to convergence properties of martingales, which you can establish in the scalar case using compactness. Right. For example, which we did earlier in the course too. You could do it that way. Mm. I presume that because of a theorem like this, there are actually a lot of different proofs of the radon Nicodem theorem, even in the scalar case. It seems like one of those theorems that can be approached in a lot of different ways. Then you get into this nice logic question of if you have two proofs of the same theorem, what does it mean for them to be equivalent? <laughs> and then apparently you get into homotopy type theory, which I know nothing about. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Well, I just have another comment. So you use twice Sorn's lemma in this proof. Mm. There is uh, sort of another trick you could imply, which is called the greedy choice. So each time I... you were picking a sequence of certain sets of positive measure, mm. if at each step you were to choose uh, the set so that the measure is as big as you can, and it, mm. there may not be, there may only be a supremum, but not a maximum. So then you just, you make sure you're within a factor two of the yeah. largest set you can pick. Yeah. Then you're going to get this tentatively decreasing sequence of yeah. sets. I know and, the argument you're talking about. Too. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that, as I just learned yesterday, that still requires a so-called countable axiom of choice. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. You're not using Zorn, but you're still using axiom of choice in some form. But the, the countable one, not the uncountable. Yeah. Well, I think you can probably make the same reduction by using a version of Zorn's lemma that stays strictly countable somehow. Yeah, so it's not as, that's right, that's right. It's a very minor point. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, like my, yeah, if you want to get into the foundations of this stuff, yeah, we're using Zorn, but you can countableify that. We're using Han Banach in various points, right? So you've got some assumptions underlying that. And yeah, you, you could really look at the foundations of this and get some interesting stuff. You could try to prove these things without using all these properties. And I remember there's one theorem I proved with Han Banach that I remember saying in the notes, you can prove it without Han Banach, like you can prove it with nothing extra. It's just the Han Banach proof is easier. And yeah, I'm not sure about this. If you, is this equivalence between the radon Nicodem property and these other things dependent on your, the set theory you work within? Quite possibly, but I don't know the answer to that. I suspect that, as you said, you can basically take countable versions of all of these axioms and everything should still work because we're working with sigma finite measure spaces implicitly as well. So that sort of lets you, lets everything become countable. Yeah. I mean, you have to assume something at some point though. <laughs> Probably, yeah. I mean, there is a lot you can do in measure theory and in, you know, countable infinite sure. analysis yeah. without extra assumptions. But that's, real, that's the boundary where you start to sometimes see extra properties come in and sometimes not. You when you're running infinities are countable, you're, it's still, you know, there's still something there. Yeah. Is it normal induction or transfinite induction? You know, potato, yeah. potato. Yeah, I don't think I've used any transfinite induction in this course yet. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay, we use Zorn. Right? Oh, well, Zorn yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Transfinite induction in disguise, sure. But yeah, that's not the point of this course. I don't want to scare people off. I think, I think if I was going to scare anybody off, it would have already happened. So anybody who's still here is comfortable with the set theoretic discussions at the end of the lectures. <laughs> So now we're doing transfinite induction. Yeah. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> no, please, please no. Um, yeah, yeah. Perhaps one could bring up continuum hypothesis somehow. Hmm. There is a lemma in the start somewhere of the analysis in Barnack Spaces book where 
they gave a certain proof and then somebody pointed out soon after the book was published that it does actually rely on the continuum hypothesis somewhere to do properly. And so they had to write a, a comment in the errata to the book. So you can have a look at that. But I forget which lemma that was. It was a major theoretic thing. If that makes sense. Mm. Ultimately, we're going to start, you know, when we work with UMD spaces, they're going to be even nicer than spaces with the rudd on nicotine property. So we're still kind of around the boundary of what we want to talk about. So we're still considering some bad Barnack spaces sometimes. But in the end, everything's going to be reflexive. And that implies right on it implies infinity MCP. So it implies right on nicotine property. And UMD implies something that's even stronger than reflexive. So we're going to be working with nice Barnack spaces. But yeah, before I can say what is nice, I need to say what's not nice. Yeah. Got to rule some things out. 